Welcome to the 30th annual Emma K. Malstrom Lecture in Physics at Hamlin University. I am Dr. Faini Smiller, President of Hamlin University. I want to begin by taking a moment to acknowledge and honor one of our legendary alumni, Carl Malstrom. After the passing of his wife, Emma K. Malstrom, he endowed this lecture series as a tribute to her and the life they spent together. Carl was a constant fixture at this annual event until his death at the age of 97 in 2010. Carl Malstrom was a physics and mathematics major in Hamlin's class of 1936, receiving his master's degree in physics from Syracuse University in 1938. Carl's early scientific career was interrupted by World War II. He was a decorated naval aviator who served in the Pacific Theater and North Africa. Once he was out of the service, Carl put his physics degree fully to work and played important roles in the development of atomic energy. He helped form the Atomic Energy Department and worked on the H-bomb. He also spent time working with the Atomic Energy Commission. Carl was highly regarded within the physics community throughout his career and made a number of significant contributions to the field. Carl endowed this lecture as a way of not only honoring his wife, Emma K. Malstrom, but as a way to give back to the Hamlin community, providing us with the means to bring to campus some of the best scientific minds in the world. 2021 marks the 30th anniversary of the Malstrom Lectures. Over the years, we've welcomed many great scientists and given students, our faculty, and the public the opportunity to talk with and learn from them. It was also abundantly clear that Carl enthusiastically enjoyed these lectures always sitting front row center. He can hardly wait to ask a question or to lend some humor. We honor Carl for his generous gifts to Hamlin and celebrate his legacy as we will continue to do for many years to come. We are very proud of our science programs at Hamlin. We attract and educate outstanding students who go on to do great things as exemplified by individuals like Carl Malstrom. There are many things that distinguish our programs. One of the most important is the opportunity for students to work closely with faculty. Faculty dedicated to helping them develop their skills and interests to the fullest extent possible. It is now my pleasure to introduce one such faculty member, Professor Lee Fong Dong, who will introduce this year's Emma K. Malstrom Lecturer in Physics. Professor Dong holds the Emma K. and Carl R. M. Malstrom Endowed Chair in Physics at Hamlin University. Professor Dong received his PhD and MS degrees in physics from Portland State University. After completing his MS in material science and engineering and BS in mechanical engineering at Qingdao University of Science and Technology in China. Professor Dong is a recipient of 22 patents and has published over 270 peer reviewed articles and book chapters. An award winning researcher Professor Dong currently works with his collaborators and students on the design, synthesis, and characterization of nanoscale materials and devices for renewable energy conversion and storage, as well as water purification and desalination. Professor Li Fang Dong. Thank you, President Miller. I'm very excited to begin this program of the 30th annual EMAK Mamshan Lecture in Physics at Hamlin University. We are honored to have Dr. Elena Aprile as our speaker. Dr. Aprile is a professor of physics at Columbia University. After obtaining her undergraduate degree in physics in Italy, she earned her PhD at the University of Geneva. Dr. Aprile started her research on noble liquid imaging detectors at the CERN and Harvard University. At Columbia, she pioneered the development of a Copton telescope for gamma ray astrophysics based on a liquid xenon time projection chamber. She later turned her attention to the dark matter question and proposed the Xenon project. 
In 2002, she founded the Zena Dark Matter Collaboration and served as its scientific spokesperson ever since. Her international team includes more than 180 scientists and students representing 24 nationalities and 23 institutions. Dr. Aprile is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and the National Academy of Science. Welcome, Dr. Aprile. It is my pleasure to be speaking to you this evening. Thank you, Hamlin University and Li Fang, for the honor to give this 30th annual K. Malmström Lecture in Physics. Um, I will tell you about my research journey over the past 15 years in search for dark matter particles with the Xenon project. Um, I will start by reviewing what we know about the universe today, or essentially what we don't know about the universe, which is 95% unknown to us, despite decades of effort. Dark matter is the dominant form of matter in the universe, and yet its nature remains a mystery. For near a century, evidence has mounted that the gravitational pull necessary to keep clusters of galaxies intact, as well as stars within galaxies, from flying apart requires much more matter that we can see, matter that has eluded our telescopes because it does not give off light at any wavelength. This dark matter makes 27% of the mass energy density of the universe, whereas ordinary matter, the atoms and molecules we are made of and which make all we can see and touch, it's only 5% of the universe. The remaining 68% is in the form of dark energy, which we believe drives the accelerated expansion of the universe. Now, the fact that we don't, we do understand only 5% or a tiny fraction of the universe makes us humble, but also determined to find, to find out what makes the two dark components, dark matter and dark energy. Last spring, I actually was lucky to visit the Dead Valley National Park with my younger daughter. And among the many beautiful things we saw was the night sky filled with the most stars, at least we have ever seen in our life before. We could even see the um, tenuous band of the Milky Way. I'm sure some of you have had this amazing experience uh, yet we should remember, I use this example to remind us all that all the stars in our galaxy and in every, other in every other galaxy and cluster of galaxies, such as the one that I show you in this uh, picture, the, an image of the coma cluster seen with the Hubble telescope eyes, a cluster that is 300 million light years away and contains thousands of galaxies, each one with billions of stars, just like our Milky Way. You know, we are not alone uh, in this universe as Abel showed us in, 20, in 1924. So if we add up all the stars in all the galaxies, in all the universe, uh, we can only account for a tiny amount of the matter that there is. We can account only for the tip of the iceberg because all these stars, this visible matter makes in, in stars makes only 1% of the total matter in the universe. The majority of the matter is actually in dust and um, uh, diffuse uh, hydrogen helium, uh, which is in the spaces between galaxies and large structures. Um, and so, this known matter, which makes the stars and everything else, is only 15% of the total. And everything else 
85% of the matter in the universe is invisible to us. And so this is the big question, first of all, we should answer if 85% of the matter in the universe is dark, how do we see, how do we know it is there? Uh, in fact, we can measure the presence of dark matter through its gravitational influence on visible matter from individual galaxies to the largest structures that we observe. We know how much dark matter there is from precision cosmology, which over the last 20 years has given us an exquisite amount of information on the origin, composition, and evolution of our universe. We think that the universe started with a dense hot phase, the Big Bang, and began its expansion 14 billion years ago. Just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the universe was expanding so fast and all the matter was created during this time. Both the normal matter, the protons and the neutrons, the atoms, uh, in, which are now in, our, in the atoms that make us, and also the dark matter was created at this time. Then 400,000 years later, the universe was so hot and dense, but still, uh, but uh, really smooth. As in this picture from the uh, measurement of the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, which shows the tiny, the, the leftover radiation from this period of the universe, which shows the tiny temperature fluctuation in all directions. The spots where there was more mass became bigger and bigger because of gravity. So gravity pulled more and more mass in these regions, which then became the seat for the structures we observe today. So the conclusion is that, I mean, the conclusion, the point here is that without dark matter, these spots would have never grown clumpier enough to create structures, which means dark matter provided the seed for normal matter to coalesce and to form galaxies and structures. And in fact, I can say, we say that dark matter is not only responsible for the galaxies not to fly apart, dark matter is actually responsible for the, the existence of our Milky Way and every other galaxy. Without dark matter, there would not be this galaxy or the solar system or the planets. So without dark matter, we would not exist. So it is that fundamental and essential for our own existence. Now, first, I think it's appropriate to say a few words about, uh, in some detail, a few words about uh, some of the evidence that we have in, in, in some details, as I said, uh, how we infer the presence of dark matter. And the most convincing evidence we have comes from the study of galactic rotation curves. Stars in a galaxy rotate slowly around the center, just like planets and our own Earth rotate around the sun, and like the sun rotates around the Milky Way. We can use this velocity to measure the mass of our galaxy, just like we measure the mass of the sun from the velocity of the Earth around it. Now, in the 1970s, uh, Vera Rubin, this great astronomer, together with her collaborator, Fred Kant, studied the rotation velocity of one galaxy after another. And what she found, what they found was quite unexpected. If you plot the velocity distribution, the way the velocity here in kilometer per second uh, as a function of the distance from the center, uh, you would expect the curve just like the dashed line here to fall off based on the expected um, uh, one over r square dependence of an object which rotates around the center under the influence of gravity. This is assuming that, of course, Newtonian mechanics and gravity is the, the way we know it. Now, what Rubin observed was that uh, the velocity of the stars was almost con constant no matter how far uh, these stars were from the center, just like if they felt the pull of some other stuff, which was not visible, either in starlight or in the uh, 21 centimeter uh, uh, wavelength from the hydrogen line that they measured. 
So the rotation velocity measured for hundreds of galaxies can only be explained if there is a large amount of dark matter in addition to the visible matter in the stars and gas and dust, which we can see and study with our telescopes. So the mass that astronomer, astron astronomers inferred for, gal infer from, for galaxies is roughly 10 times more than visible. And uh, of course, uh, this observation of this presence of something else to provide the gravity necessary to keep the stars in these galaxies, but also uh, galaxies in an entire cluster not to fly apart, was actually um, seen even earlier, was, was, was done, this observation was done even earlier, actually in the 1933, Fred Zwicky, a Swiss astronomer, um, uh, discovered uh, a similar, um, or made a similar conclusion from the measurements of the motion of galaxies in the coma cluster, uh, the same coma I showed you earlier, concluding a similar, uh, uh, a similar um, making a similar conclusion that 10 times more mass than invisible must, was, must have been there to explain the motion. And in fact, he called it uh, dark matter, dunkel materia. So, um, these are two of the evidences, but uh, perhaps the most uh, visual way to see the presence of dark matter in, uh, in, in, in the cosmos is through the phenomenon of gravitational lensing that was predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity, which says the light is deflected by the presence of a mass. And uh, Athenians and not so far, I mean, recent enough example uh, for showing this presence of dark matter is the, is the, is the observation of this so-called system, of the system called the bullet cluster, which is uh, two colliding clusters of galaxies. Uh, and the three major components of this pair are the stars, the gas, and the dark matter. And these components behave quite differently during the, during the collision of these two. Uh, large objects. The stars of the galaxies, which are observed in the visible light, are not too much affected by the collision. They just pass through uh, each other. The hot gas of the two colliding um, uh, pairs um, uh, uh, heat up. Uh, and as they heat up, they emit X-rays, which can be seen in X, uh, which are observed here uh, in, which were observed, I think, with Chandra X-ray telescope, which are seen here in red or in pink. These represent the majority of the baryonic or normal matter in the cluster, as I told you before, the majority is in, in gas, dust. Um, so these gases interact electromagnetically, and so they slow down much more than the stars. The third component, the dark matter, which is detected indirectly by the gravitational lensing of background object, which is shown here in um, purple, in blue, um, they, uh, these, these dark matter components in the two clusters just are at the edges here, as you can see, they just pass through one each other as if the baryonic matter in pink here would not even be present. So this picture supports the idea that most of the mass in the cluster pair is in the form of these regions of dark matter, which bypass the gas region as if the baryonic matter were not even there, right? So dark matter holds uh, the universe together, uh, holds galaxies and clusters together, but to this day, no one really know what it is. So understanding the nature of dark matter is really fundamental to physics and cosmology and to our own existence, as I mentioned before. Uh, so the fact that dark matter is uh, so far, I mean, maybe I didn't tell you, so far uh, we have searched for this dark matter, of, we have searched to uh, identify the true nature of this dark matter, but we have not identified yet any uh, put in any candidate. But the fact that we, we are, the dark matter has eluded the detection so far means 
not only that the true, yes, it means that the true nature is still a mystery, but um, the search for dark matter and the, the hunt for its true nature has given us a lot of information about what it is and what it is not. So we know how much there is, and we know it very precisely from uh, measurements of the CMB to the 1% level or better. Um, uh, we know that it is cold on, when we say cold, we mean non-relativistic, I mean slowly moving, because if dark matter would move too quickly, it would not allow or it would suppress the formation of structures. Uh, leading to different scenarios or different different structure than what we actually observe and simulate. In fact, we, we have very precise simulation of, of the universe today, which we can match with the real data only if we allow the right amount of dark matter and the right type of dark matter to be present. We know that dark matter is neutral, it has no charge, no self-interaction. We saw it in the Buller cluster, that dark matter just goes through one cluster to another. Only weak interactions with standard matter and with itself. Uh, we know it's non-baryonic, it's not made of anything which makes normal matter. It's not made of uh, uh, baryons or the atoms and molecules that that we know of, because we know from Big Bang nucleus synthesis, from cosmic microwave background data, that um, how much hydrogen, deuterium, helium-3, helium-4, lithium-7, all these light elements, uh, how much of these the universe was born with shortly after the Big Bang. And these measurements also determine how much normal matter the universe uh, not only was born, and, uh, and, and, and that the value is only one sixth of the total mass. So the other five sixths must be dark matter, something we don't know. We also know it's stable. Uh, we say we, we, it should be stable or long lived with respect to the 14 billion years of the universe. Otherwise it would have decayed already, it would not be present today as we see. It. Now, when we look at the non elementary particles, the ones which make the normal matter, and here is a nice chart of the six quarks in the top half and the leptons in the lower half, and the force carriers, including the latest, the Higgs boson discovered in 2012 at CERN. So when we look at these fundamental known particles and we ask if any of them could be the dark matter, we, uh, we conclude that none of them actually is a good candidate for dark matter. Uh, it must be, if it is in the form of a particle, dark matter is a new, uh, yet unidentified fundamental particle. And the leading hypothesis is actually um, that dark matter is a new particle created in the early phase of our universe, maybe a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. Um, and if such relics, as we call them, are stable, as I said before, they might still be around today and uh, form the halos of our galaxy and every other galaxy. So uh, this is the leading hypothesis. And um, of course, the generic, we, we, as is shown here, dark matter relics, but there's, uh, um, this is a large class of particles. And if you want to go more in details, we know, uh, well, physicists has a lot of uh, fantasies. And so uh, candidates for both relics and also other type of particle dark matter candidates have been um, are abundant. There is a zoo of them. And, uh, um, and they span uh, uh, many orders of magnitude in mass from primordial black holes, very massive primordial black holes here. And this plot, the scale is an electron volt, which is a unit of energy, where the proton mass, it's uh, you know, one giga electron volts, one billion electron volt. And so uh, all the way down to very, very light uh, axions, for instance, which is another, which is a dark matter candidate, which uh, is uh, actively being searched 
uh, for a long time as well, along with the um, most studied of these uh, candidates, which is the generic class of WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. This plot shows actually uh, the height of the column shows the number of papers um, which have been written on the particular candidate. And you can see that the WIMPs, the class of WIMPs, of course, has received the most attention simply because uh, we say it's theoretically well motivated, which means it's a, it's a very attractive candidate, the WIMP, because we have, uh, we can, uh, we find them naturally in theories um, which have been developed to extend the particle, the standard model of particle physics, which it describes exquisitely well a lot of the phenomena, all the phenomena that we know and see, but it has some shortcomings. And so there are theories, <laughs> sorry, beyond the standard model, which we call, for instance, supersymmetric theories. Supersymmetry is one example or extra dimensions. And in these theories beyond standard model, we find naturally um, occurring um, particles with the right characteristics as WIMPs. And these models, these theories were developed um, to solve other problems than the dark matter problem. So it is appealing to see that there is a particle out there in SUSY which can uh, fulfill all the characteristics of the dark matter particle uh, we are looking for. Now, these WIMPs, which are all around us, um, uh, are being searched. Um, uh, in, in many ways, there are several. Uh, there are uh, there are three ways with which we actually search. Uh, currently, or for the past decades, actually, have been searching for winds. We can either directly produce these particles at the highest energy accelerator that we have built so far, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, as proton proton collide with each other, proton proton collisions which uh, in this collision, we actually simulate or reach uh, conditions similar to those of the early universe. And then we expect to see these particles um, produced uh, and detected by these massive experiments such as ATLAS and CMS and the LHC. Um, we also, a second way that we have to search for WIMPs is to detect uh, standard model particles such as neutrinos, uh, photons, on, uh, or antiparticles like anti helium, anti deuterium, as the WIMPs annihilate in dense regions of the cosmos, such as in the Sun or in the center of the Milky Way. A uh, third approach, which is the one that uh, we follow with the, uh, what our experiment and many other experiments on Earth, is to is, is the direct detection, is to look for these WIMPs in an earthbound laboratory. Uh, I mean, assuming of course, that we are lucky and the dark, dark matter interaction with normal matter is not too weak to be able for us to detect it. So that's, that brings me to the, to the, to this method of, WIMPs direct detection, and I say it one more time, what we are looking for in this uh, direct detection experiment, such as the Xenon experiment I'll spend the rest of the lectures on, is to measure the energy that is released uh, in, a, in an elastic collision of a WIMP with an atomic nucleus or with an electron um, in, in, in atoms of ever detectors that I put on Earth, I mean, in a laboratory. Now, uh, if the WIMP scatters preferentially with the nucleus of the atom, uh, it will deposit its energy in a very localized region of space, um, and which will make it more distinguishable from the majority of other scatterings of other particles from background noises, which preferentially scatter of the atomic electron. And we'll say more about this. But so we're looking for an elastic collision of a wind with a nucleus of an atom in first approximation. And that's our observable measure, this tiny energy that the wind imparts to this nucleus. Um, we can uh, ask what to expect 
in a detector if I put a detector in the right environment. So we can calculate what we say the rate of events. And this rate depends, of course, on the number of nuclei that I managed to put in my detector, how much mass I have of normal matter. But it depends also on the local density here is written rho zero of the dark matter particles in the, near the Earth, where the experiment is, we are on this planet, and also on their velocity distribution. But it depends also on particle physics in the sense that it depends on what theoretical model I assume in terms of interaction, cross-section, the scattering cross-section, and also the mass of the particle. And so the main feature of this rate, if you like, or what is to be seen in a detector is actually a bit disappointing for an experimentalist because what we expect to see if we measure a certain number of these events is a, a very steeply falling exponential with no feature, uh, just like the one you expect from any background radiation in your laboratory. And uh, there is a distinction that you have if the mass of the particle WIMP is, is small or if it's massive, or the, if it's a massive particle, uh, you have a more uh, a less steeply falling exponential than, it if, than if it is a light wave. But otherwise, you really don't expect to see any um, particular characteristic, which makes it, again, challenging. But the main challenge really, uh, it's, uh, it's summarized in this slide, in sense we're looking really for the needle in the haystack because we're looking for a very small energy um, deposited in most materials that we can use or think as a detector. So we're talking kilo electron volt in energy, which is uh, for most detectors, uh, a very low energy. But uh, the biggest challenge is that if you calculate the event rate, how many events you expect per unit time, per unit mass, in a material, uh, given what we have not observed, given the uh, the fact that we have not observed WIMPs um, to date, we have placed constraint on the scattering strength, interaction strength. We are looking today for a, an event rate which is less than one event. If you have one thousand kilogram of material, and if you are patient to wait for one year. Uh, so this is a very, very rare search, if you think a moment, because such an event rate less than one in a ton in a year, it's really nothing, I mean, compared to the huge, huge background, millions times larger uh, of signals from other particles, other uh, particles other than waves, right? Uh, for comparison, just to... Just to, to give an example, I mean, um, a lot of these other particles are coming from sources which include, in, you know, intrinsic radioactivity in materials. Everything we, we use to make these experiments, in a sense, is radioactive. Uh, in, it contains isotopes which decay, giving a large number of alpha, I mean, of neutrons or alpha or gamma rays, right? But uh, the same way that you can think for a moment that, you know, everything is radioactive, including you and me, I mean, the human body, right? The natural radioactivity in your body, if you were to count a person of about uh, typical mass, 70 kilogram, it's about 10 million events per day just due to the isotopes of um, carbon-14 and the potassium-40 that we have in our, in our blood, in our, in our body. So there is a lot of uh, background radiation out there, and this is actually reducing this background uh, in these experiments is the holy grail of the old search for direct detection. Um, the Earth itself, including, I mean, it's not just us, but the Earth itself is very radioactive, but it's also constantly com bombarded um, by radiation from outer space. So the first requirement is to operate detectors deep underground, uh, when we say deep below the surface of the Earth, right? And we use mountains, we use deep mines to shield these detectors from this cosmic noise. Uh, there are many 
I think about 17 or so laboratory worldwide, um, which uh, hosts a, a, a variety of experiments in search for dark matter and other rare uh, event searches. I happen to work at the largest of all these uh, underground laboratory. This is the Gran Sasso underground laboratory in Italy. It is built under the Corno Grande in central, uh, in the central Apennine mountains. And there are, under these mountains, they have been, there have been excavated, there's been, uh, we have made the, the most, uh, uh, the largest, yes, but the most amazing laboratory worldwide, to be honest, uh, with three cathedral size um, um, experimental halls here, they're shown in the sketch. Um, a cathedral, because they are, each one is about 100 meter long, 14 meter in height. Um, and this is where, this is where the Xenon experiment is hosted. Um, the lab uh, is reached via a motorway, the highway and a 10 kilometer tunnel here. Um, the direct access, access of this laboratory. The proximity to a, an airport such as Rome, Fiumicino, which is only, which is about 150 kilometers away. And the fact that it is located in one of the most beautiful regions in Italy with great food and wine um, and a natural park by itself makes the, makes working at this lab actually, um, um, uh, a nice experience and has, has, makes, has made it very easy for my experiment to progress at this laboratory. Um, so that's where we place the experiment, that's where Xenon is placed. And uh, in terms of uh, just uh, uh, reviewing that it's not just the Xenon experiment, there is many experiments worldwide I mentioned already in the different laboratory, all these experiments measure typically two of the three signatures that we expect when radiation such as a WIMP uh, goes through normal matter. Uh, the energy which is deposited, let's say, or is imparted by a WIMP to the nucleus of an atom is um, reveal, reveals itself through either a vibration of a crystal, if the material is a crystal, such as germanium or silicon crystal, uh, it reveals itself through the um, charges, the ionization electron that are liberated. Um, you know, you free electron from the atoms and they, they can be, uh, they can move around and produce a current. So we have charge, a charge signal, but we also have uh, excitation of um, atoms and molecules leading to what we call scintillation, which therefore um, means a light signal. And so many experiments are using a combination of two of these signals, but you see that um, several of them, other than germanium and silicon or some special scintillating crystal like calcium tank state in the Crest experiment, a larger number of these experiments including Xenon are using noble liquids. In particular, or specifically a large number, several of them are using liquid Xenon as target and detector material. And so that brings me to the point, before I talk about my favorite material, let's first see uh, where we are today. I mean, it's, it's important to review what have we seen so far, the state of the art is set. <laughs> it's here represented in this plot, which shows the interaction cross-section of a wimp with a nucleon in normal matter as a function of a potential wimp mass in GeV per square centimeter. So we have not, as I mentioned, seen any signal, a uh, significant signal. And so this has led us to, to do to best to constrain the interaction. And the best constraint of this wimp uh, normal matter interactions come from the Xeno one ton experiment with a minimum you can see in the red curve here, uh, published in 2018, uh, the best results from the Xeno family with the lowest exclusion limit, as we call it, in a very large or broad range of masses or winds, uh, with a minimum in this, in the, uh, as in this number for the 
interaction cross section is less than 4.1 times 10 to the minus 47 square centimeter if the wimp for a wimp of 30 GeV per square centimeter. You can see that we uh, we have excluded over the over the years a very large fraction of all this potential interaction uh, cross section uh, for winds, but we haven't found them. So now, why is liquid inner such a good material for dark matter detector? I will try to say uh, uh, I can talk forever about this material. Um, for, for why is it good for dark matter? The xenon atom is large, has 54 protons, 77 neutrons in its nucleus. Uh, this many nucleus are actually good because the probability for a wimp to collide actually scales with the square of the number of protons and neutrons that exist in the atom, in the nucleus of the atom. So the other reason why it's good for dark matter is that natural xenon includes many isotopes uh, which actually have nuclear spin. And so if we want to test the, the, um, the preference of, I mean, we want to test the interaction of a WIMP, uh, if a WIMP likes to couple to the spin, to the nuclear spin uh, with a xenon detector, we actually can test that simultaneously um, with the spin interaction, uh, spin independent interaction, as we say. Now, uh, in its liquid form, when we make it liquid, we cool it down. Xenon is very, liquid xenon is very dense. It has three times the density of water at about minus 100 degrees centigrade. Um, this is actually good if you want to realize a massive yet compact uh, experiment uh, for WIMPs. In fact, the cooling and the keeping it cold and clean uh, has uh, been part of my, uh, let's say, research for many years. We have improved our technologies to keep liquid xenon cold, clean. And we have also improved our um, ability to reduce intrinsic uh, radioactivity such as Krypton-85, um, uh, which of course, uh, the reason why we don't want this Krypton-85 or Krypton uh, in xenon, which is present in very tiny amount. Uh, the reason we don't want Krypton-85 is because it is a beta emitter, as we say, and this means it gives us quite some background in the region of interest where we're looking for WIMP. So we need to clean the xenon from Krypton to reduce this Krypton-85 contamination. One of the um, uh, one words about xenon, which is not written here, Actually, if you look at where we get xenon, it's, it's a noble gas, it's a rare gas, so it's present in air, like all the other rare elements, but the concentration in air of xenon is very tiny, but nine, uh, the nine per million level by volume, which means that the, um, uh, in, if you think the availability of this uh, noble gas, of course, it's limited, but we have to realize that xenon is a byproduct of the distillation of air, which is driven by the production of oxygen. We need oxygen to, in our economy to produce steel. Uh, and so the cost of um, xenon and other rare elements actually goes, uh, um, scales with the economy, if you like, the more, the more oxygen you need because you have to produce a lot of or build a lot of bridges and buildings because the, the economy is strong, um, the less uh, you pay for uh, uh, a, a liter of xenon gas because you produce more of it and so on and so forth. So over the course of my careers, over the tens, uh, at least 20 years or more that I've been uh, buying or procuring xenon from my lab experiment, I've seen huge fluctuation in the cost of this uh, xenon gas, uh, which uh, ranged from a few dollars per liter to the current price of 20 or more dollars per liter. And I remind you all we see from the uh, volume ratio, in, if you want to remember a number, um, because of its compressibility, you need about 500 or more, 500 liters of gas with xenon to make one liquid liter, which is three kilograms. So it's a very 
uh, expensive liquid indeed. Um, um, now, the main reason, in my opinion, why xenon is so uh, fabulous for a detector is the, is the uh, presence of these two signals, which we can simultaneously detect. It is a very um, appealing material for addition detection uh, because um, it is a very good scintillator and it's also a great ionizer. So in terms, among all the noble liquid, it has the largest yields of charges and light that we uh, have measured. And the amount of ionization electrons and scintillation photons that you expect in a xenon detector um, depend, of course, on the particle type that comes in, but is guided by these two basic processes the direct excitation of atoms and molecules, which bring to uh, dimers, and through the de-excitation of these excited states, you get this uh, very deep UV light, um, which is one of the signals we detect. Uh, but you also have the ionization um, produced, uh, and uh, the electrons, actually, which are stripped from the atoms, uh, like to recombine with the parent ions. And um, that recombination process that we continue to uh, study today leads also to the formation of excited uh, states and therefore light. So we have actually two sources of light in these noble liquids, direct excitation and recombination, in addition to the free electrons that we can um, uh, liberate. So this, these processes in xenon uh, are still, as I mentioned, complex. Um, to, I mean, are still being studied today, sorry, uh, and have been a big part of my um, research over the years before turning into building an actual detector for dark matter. In fact, the best detector that we have conceived to uh, use for a dark matter search is the so-called two-phase um, time projection chamber, uh, with whose principle of operation is shown here very quickly. Um, essentially, we have a vat to a container filled with this cryogenic minus 100 degrees centigrade cold liquid. Um, uh, and, uh, we instrument this volume with two arrays of photosensors, which are sensitive in this very deep UV, 175 nanometer light, produced when a particle goes through uh, to, 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 to give both this fast signal of light through direct excitation uh, or through the recombination process, but also to measure the secondary light, which we detect uh, um, uh, through the uh, drift of the carriers in the liquid uh, and the extractions of these electrons from liquid to gas through the trick, as we say, of proportional scintillation. We, um, we drift this electron across the liquid layer and when they um, are extracted in the gas, in the cold gas above the liquid, we actually accelerate them with a stronger field even. And during this acceleration in the gas, these electrons produce more light. So we end up turning the energy, which is deposited, let's say, by the particle, by the wimp, into two signals of light, which we call S1 and S2, which are separated in time, which gives us the depth of the interaction, and which are detected by the same photosensors. And the pattern of light on this photosensor actually allows us to measure the position in X and Y of the interaction. Furthermore, the ratio of these two signals of charge and light, if you like, is dependent on the particle, as I mentioned already. And we use this information also to our advantage to discriminate particles such as wind or neutrons which are the enemies of the wind from the more common gamma and beta background. But one of the key uh, advantage of this technology is that it is a, with this three-dimensional position reconstruction that we have on an event by event basis, we can actually um, do a lot of things to minimize background, which I said is the only grail, to identify and minimize the background 
which can contaminate our potential signal through fiducial volume selection, as we say, because we can recognize in X and Y where the event happened and reject, let's say, events which are very close to the walls where the background is largest, for instance. <clears throat> we can also identify events which have a single interaction, which is a prerequisite for a WIMP scattering from events which have multiple scatters, such as neutrons. And that's a great uh, advantage of a, of a position sensor detector. Now, these are the, uh, this basic principle of a detector has been realized in this family of experiments of the Xenon family from the first prototype Xenon 10 to the current Xenon Anton experiment. Uh, so we have gone from 20, 2005 or so to today in 15 years from a mass of about 15 kilograms uh, to a mass of 8,500 kilograms in such detectors. And we have probed cross sections over uh, uh, for more than four or five, almost uh, uh, four or five orders of magnitude or so we plan to probe. A, a major evolution of this detector in scale and in mass. And this has been the greatest, let's say, appeal of this technology, the scalability of this detector, which we have rightly demonstrated well with this family of the Xenon experiment and coupled with other experiments, um, competing, as we say, experiment worldwide from the LZ experiment, uh, the Lux Zeppelin experiment based on the same technology to the Panda X family of experiments uh, by in China. Um, uh, ultimately, we are planning to uh, probe the entire region of parameters for mass, or especially for cross-sectional WIMP nuclear interaction with a 50-ton detector in a generation three experiment um, to come eventually. So that's the family of Xenon detectors. So let me say a few words about the Xenon one ton. Uh, which was the first tone scale um, liquid xenon time projection chamber built um, uh, worldwide and which has had an amazing performance in terms of um, uh, stability and also richness of science results uh, with, a, with a one year or so of data taking carried out in albeit the Grand Sasso Laboratory here is um, uh, a view of what you will see if you were visit if you were to visit the Grand Sasso lab, the infrastructure of the xenon one ton, which is now being reused for the xenon n ton experiment, which consists of this three story building, um, about ten meters in height, with transparent walls, in order for you to marvel the beautiful equipment we built, designed, engineered, built and used for this experiment. And next to the building, there is the so-called um, uh, water container, this uh, big water tank, 10 meter diameter, so 10 meter tall, in which the actual um, detector is suspended. You know, it's not enough to be in this beautiful laboratory under 1400 meter of rock, of the Gran Sasso rock. Uh, we need to do something else to further reduce the the flux of cosmic rays to further protect our experiment for ambient radiation. And so that's where the water is used as a very cost effective material. Of course, here we implement, um, we instrument the water with photomultiplier. We use this tank as a, an active muon uh, Cherenkov detector. Um, and for Xenon and Ton, actually, we have built another detector around the TPC to specifically veto or reject uh, neutron events very close to the uh, xenon detector. A lot to say, but this is a picture of how the xenon one ton uh, TPC looked like a few years back uh, already now before uh, finishing its, in its installation in the above ground clean room just before transporting it underground. Um, a major journey for building this first large-scale detector was not only, of course, 
to design the best way, but also to choose the the the, the campaign to choose the most uh, appropriate materials in terms of uh, um, being compatible both with being realistic material to build a detector, but also the lowest material in terms of radioactivities. Um, which takes a long time to do this. Uh, to do this, this is how it actually looked. Uh, you know, one ton TPC mounted below the dome of the so-called dual wall cryostatic, which it is enclosed. You see a beautiful picture of the top and bottom array of photosensors. This three-inch uh, diameter, uh, specially designed Amamatsu photomultiplier to be very efficient at 175 nanometer and also very low in radioactivity as well as stable in low temperature condition or reliable in low temperature condition. A lot of work has gone into developing these sensors as well. You see copper for shaping the electric field that we have to apply across these electrodes to produce the field for the electrons to drift. And you see a lot of white stuff, which is Teflon, a good insulator, but also a good UV reflector. Um, this is to give you a size of the, of the container, the dual wall cryostat um, insulated with vacuum and mylar, which was uh, designed and built for Xenoventon with the idea to reuse the outer vessel actually for the Xenoventon phase, which is actually what's happening, about one and a half meter or so in diameter. Um, I was quite present at the time of um, designing and building the Xeno one ton at the lab following the construction of the detector and other systems on site. Um, this is a picture of the detector in uh, suspended through this umbilical pipe uh, in the water tank. And this is, uh, of course, with the water Cherenkov. Uh, Vito implemented before we fill the water, of course, and you can see the detector in the center of this beautiful structure. Uh, what else? A lot to say here, but just beautiful picture. This is a, a slide summarizing the wealth of science of physics results obtained uh, largely uh, obtained with Zeno One Town, actually. And so I don't have time to tell you a lot about this, but uh, a large a uh, number of these paper, of course, have focused on searching for WIMPs in different scenarios, but searching both for massive WIMPs in spin independent, spin dependent, and in other channels, but also for light dark matter, bosonic dark matter. We have searched for solar boronate neutrino through the coherent scattering of these neutrinos on xenonuclei. We have searched for solar neutrinos. And uh, we have seen um, serendipitously, I mean, um, at the double electron capture on Xenon 124, uh, a beautiful result in itself, which all a lot of this work was made possible by the, by the ultra low background that Xenon 1 ton was able to achieve despite its larger size. I didn't mention that, but that was one of the greatest accomplishments of this experiment. So now the last few minutes, I'm going to tell you about uh, moving from Zeno, how we moved from the Zeno one ton phase, uh, paving the way for the world and to build larger scale TPC. And we ourselves moved to the uh, multi-ton scale really with the Zeno and ton uh, with the detector I told you uh, using 8,500 kilogram of Zeno and implementing or designing new system to make this most sensitive experiment even better than before, especially with the goal of reducing the overall background, especially the background in um, uh, intrinsic radioactivity such as radon uh, by another order of magnitude with respect to xenon uh, one ton. So a lot to say, but this is the same picture I showed you before, a beautiful, more recent picture in black and white. Um, this is the actual Xenon Anton TPC, much larger, uh, built um, during 20, uh, 2019 and assembled finally during COVID time or just before COVID exploded everywhere, including in Italy, we just managed lucky uh, to close it in the, into its vessel prior to the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, pandemic 
um, blocking all the operations everywhere, including at the lab. And with the help of a few dedicated on-site um, postdocs and student and technician, we were able to continue uh, making progress with Zinon and Tom despite COVID actually. Myself spending time in Italy last year, and of course this year, to push forward with Zinon and Tom. Uh, I think I will skip uh, the important role of cryogenic and purification infrastructure that my group particularly contributed to um, um, over the years, and that's something I'm very uh, proud of. But uh, let's uh, show just some picture the cryogenic system, which is the heart of the experiment using pulse tube refrigerators um, uh, to cool the xenon, um, a, a special um, uh, container or bottle, if you like, this spherical high pressure, uh, pressurized vessel, which can keep the xenon in liquid. Uh, uh, gases or uh, solid form, you cannot handle, I mean, you cannot deal with uh, uh, hundreds of bottles uh, of uh, typical size to fill and recover the xenon you know, from this experiment. So we, had the, we have developed special um, storage and recovery vessel. This is the beautiful one that I was involved with for Xenon One Ton, which is being reused for Xenon and Ton along with another one. Just picture of us, me, my students, my scientists around these facilities when we build them for Xenon One Ton, reusing them now. Um, the latest baby here is the contribution of my group, particularly to the liquid Xenon purification. For the first time, we have done some R&D in the past several few years, actually, to develop this design, this system for xenon and ton in order to um, purify the xenon from electronegative impurity in, in, in the most efficient and fast way with comparing with respect to the way that we have been using uh, over the past many decades for xenon in cleaned in the gaseous phase. We have been able to achieve the longest lifetime ever seen in liquid xenon detector of about 20 millisecond electron lifetime with this liquid purification system. A very important milestone for the experiment. Yes, we started to fill the detector in September of last year. Again, um, some of the uh, people on site, including myself, the cryogenic expert, it was a very important moment for the experiment. And the experiment has been filled since then, and we are actually completed the, com the uh, commissioning. This is a picture of the other system, the neutron beta. I don't have time to tell you about, but it's also beautiful, essential new system to reduce the background of this experiment. And when I say we, it's the collaboration. The Xenon collaboration, which today includes about 180 scientists from 27 institutions, uh, a lot of students, about 60 PhD students, master students, and a lot of young postdocs and researchers who actually move from one institution to another as student and postdoc and professor building their own groups and continuing to work on Zen. And it's really, I'm really thankful for this group of people with whom I've been working for many years. Um, exceptional quality and exceptional dedication. So here I stop, we continue to search. We are excited to have started to search with Zenon and Ton in an effort to answer still these basic questions about what dark matter is made of and uh, what is the distribution of dark matter in the Milky Way. I'm sure that dark matter, actually I'm quite sure dark matter doesn't come in one flavor, but for now we continue to focus on the, um, on the WIMP and as many other experiments around the world, of course, expand the effort to search in all directions to answer this basic question about the nature of dark matter. Thank you so much. That is great. Thank you, Professor Apredi. That is great project. So do you have some questions for you? 
And the first question, did you look at any other elements before settling on Zena? <clears throat> did I look at other evidence? Can you hear me? Did, yeah, did you no. look at any other elements before the Zena? Oh, other elements, sorry, not evidence. Uh, no, the xenon comes out to be, the xenon was an element that I was uh, very familiar with and it happens to be, uh, it happened to be quite ideal as I tried to explain for dark matter search. So I was familiar with liquid argon through my research at Harvard or before even, and I studied liquid argon, liquid krypton, but among all these noble liquids, xenon was the best, yes, when I started. Okay, thank you. And second question, you talk about you, before you work on the gamma ray astrophysics, how did you start to work on the dark matter from the gamma ray astrophysics? <clears throat> so for gamma ray astrophysics, this Compton telescope that you mentioned uh, uses the same element as you said, the liquidine and time projection chamber, but it was operated in a different way. Uh, the, the question in gamma ray astrophysics was actually to measure the energy and the location of uh, radioactivity is produced in supernova explosion in the sky, in the universe, if you like, and you want to know, still today, uh, it's very difficult to measure this uh, MEV gamma rays, as we say, for instance, from uh, <clears throat> sodium-22 or titanium-44 or aluminum-26. These elements, which are radioactive, are produced in the nucleosynthesis processes which goes on in stars and uh, in supernova explode in exploding stars like the supernova and it remains an issue to identify exactly where the sites of nucleosynthesis are in the universe so you need an imaging detector and that was for several years my research funded by NASA to mm, make the perfect Compton telescope uh, and we did realize the so-called Alexi Grid Telescope, which was flown on balloon, long-duration, long high-altitude balloons, um, using the NASA facility both in New Mexico and Texas to test these telescopes. So I had the familiarity with the technology, although it was uh, tailored to higher energy radiation, MEV, whereas for WIMPs, when I attended this, uh, how did I turn my attention? I attended a conference in 2001, the SNOMAS meeting somewhere, I don't remember Colorado, I don't remember where it was, but uh, I got really intrigued by the issue of uh, dark matter, but also about the technologies that other groups had been developed and they were being, that they were, use, they were using for the search and I, uh, it was very clear that the liquid xenon imaging technology was quite appropriate for the same um, physics, although you needed to understand many things that they were, they were new to us, to me, because we never used liquid xenon detector for such low energy radiation detection. So there was a lot of R&D uh, with which the Xenon project started to understand how many electrons, how many photons are actually liberated by a few kV nuclear recoil, which you, you get from a scattering of a particle such as a WIMP with a nucleus. We had no idea when we started. And so that went into several papers, several um, R&D projects carried out at Columbia before we could even realize the first Xenon 10 prototype. Thank you. Another question you mentioned about neutrino. So has there been any indication that dark matter particles and neutrinos have interactions with each other? Mm. So neutrinos for quite a while away, I mean, neutrinos, if you think about it, they are neutral, they're weakly interacting, so they are uh, <clears throat> ideally a good candidate, it could be a good candidate for dark matter, warm dark matter or hot dark matter, because uh, 
uh, the knowledge that we have uh, uh, acquired that neutrinos uh, through the oscillation experiment the neutrinos are not massless they have a tiny tiny mass and so that makes them move uh, fast so they are too fast essentially to um, to explain the the structure that we observe as i said we need to have cold dark matter uh, particles which move slowly non-relativistically and so it cannot be neutrino uh, it could be uh, i mean we are looking for one of these candidates if you look at one of those uh, um, uh, candidates that i showed there are ne sterile neutrinos a new form new type of neutrinos which would be uh, an indication of again physics beyond the standard model and there are experiments searching for sterile neutrinos uh, we haven't found them yet, so that could be another candidate for dark matter, but it does not, it cannot be the standard uh, neutrino of the three families that we know. Thank you. And another question is, what interests you the most about dark matter? It's a tough question. Well, I mean, what interests me the most is what is on everybody's mind. I would love to find out what it is. Most likely it's going to be, I mean, it's likely that we don't have any, a single candidate only. I mean, why should there be only one type of particles to make all this mass in the universe? We have so many particles in the standard model. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, apart from, uh, uh, I think that's the, first, the most important question. If we can contribute through these experiments to get a little bit more knowledge about what this ma dark matter can be, of course, it's fundamental. It's clear that it's something that we have to spend a lot of effort in continuing to find. We might be on the wrong track because maybe it's not made of particles at all and we're looking in vain. But if we don't look, we're never going to find. So in order, for instance, to put this WIMP idea to rest, we need to explore the entire uh, uh, region of uh, possibilities, both in mass of this particle, but also in cross-section, in interaction strength. And this is what we're doing with this current uh, level of experiments, such as Xenon Anton, which are the largest ever, there might be a need to explore the entire so-called theoretical uh, prediction space with even a next generation experiment at the 50 ton scale, as I mentioned. And then eventually we know the neutrinos and not the sterile neutrinos, neutrinos from supernova, from stars, I mean, from the atmosphere, uh, from the sun, they're going to give us a signal and then eventually it's going to be an irreducible background that we have to face. We, we can turn our detectors into neutrino detectors, but uh, we have to stop at some point. But then we would have said that the WIMP idea, at least at that level of cross-section, is not possible to be detected with this detector, at least so far. Um, yeah. But it gives me great uh, pleasure to, this dark matter idea, which of course it, it is all about the nature of dark matter, but what I like most in my research is that by pushing our technology to make it always a better machine, a better detector, we continue to have a lot of fun. I mean, you have to have fun in what you do, no matter what you do as a scientist or not. Uh, the size of the collaboration is large, but these experiments are still uh, at, on a human scale. You know, all these students and postdocs have a great opportunity to actually contribute to each of these experiments that we build. So we are forming at the same time uh, the future scientists uh, in, this, in this field and in, for other application, of course, Xenon is interesting. And so that gives me a lot of drive, let's say, when you get sad because you don't see a signal, <laughs> the pleasure comes from saying we have had a lot of fun in developing Xenon one ton, Xenon n ton, and keep pushing um, ahead and solve problems and 
meet the challenges which we have to meet every time we have to develop a new instrument. So forming new people, it's, it's, it goes with the dark matter now, but I mean, it is important as well. Or it is part of my, let's say, uh, what drives me in what I do. Yeah, the next question seems you already answered part of. So that means another question is, you mentioned that your research can be like finding a needle in a haystack. Mm. How do you find the patience and the motivation when searching for something so difficult to find? Yeah, patience, which I don't have. So as I said, maybe... <laughs> Uh, finding this needle in this haystack is really, there are two reasons. One is the fun, as I said, because as we improve these detectors, there is a lot of technological challenges and I'm driven by, you know, I'm a problem solver. I like to, I, I, I live on challenges. So uh, if you tell me how do you handle this 8,000 kilogram detector when you started with a few kilogram detector, which I could not even imagine when I proposed then, I know, start to think of all the difficulties and problem with uh, uh, cooling it and keeping it cold and clean it and reduce this background to an unprecedented level. That is one drive. And as I said, it's also this idea that um, not only, of course, you involve your graduate students, they keep getting old. I mean, you, you renew your graduate student, the older one come back being professors here and there and still being part of your collaboration. You see their babies grown into <laughs> young students. I mean, the life goes on. But what what is also essential is that I think it's also that we know what to do. You know, it's a technology, once you have mastered it, there is always something more to learn. So you become an expert in this specific type of detectors and issues and problems, and you are the be your best place to solve it. So there's always something new to do, something better to do, and that comes almost natural. I would be, uh, I never think of, let's say, turning my attention to an axion search because the technology that you need to search for these other very promising and interesting candidates for dark matter are completely different than what I know. You would be a fool to start a new, especially at my age. So you have to couple the whole thing. Uh, it has been fun first and foremost, and um, there is still a lot to improve with this type of detector, with, which keeps, keeps me fight for it constantly. Thank you. Then I received a couple of questions related with black holes. The okay. first one said, might not supermassive black holes at the center of a galaxy have a major contribution in holding together the galaxies? And if so, how might, how might you separate the contribution of dark matter with supermassive black holes? Mm, I don't know if I understand the question well. I'm not an expert. I'm not an astronomy expert at all, a black hole expert. We know that we have a black hole in the center of our galaxy and in, in all the galaxies. Uh, uh, supermassive or at least uh, massive black holes are, uh, are being considered also as a candidate for dark matter. Of course, if that would be the way that dark matter, uh, one of the components, if you like, of dark matter, one of the way dark matter presents itself, that's something that I cannot distinguish with my detector. I'm not searching. I don't know how to search for a signal of dark matter through a black hole with my xenon detector. So as I said before, it's likely that dark matter comes, um, might be made of, is made of different components. What we're searching here is really a specific type of particle, a particle that we have a way to see in a detector on Earth. And we're not going to see uh, um, 
uh, how does the black hole, which is at the center of the Milky Way, interact in our terrestrial experiment? That's not something that we can, I cannot think about it. Okay. Yeah, another is related to black holes and as a hypothetical, let's say, as dark matter expand the universe, could it theoretically escape a black hole? Furthermore, as black holes die from the loss of uh, Parkinson's radiation, could black holes possibly be the creators of a new universe? Yeah, very, maybe also philosophical question. I don't think I can answer that. I mean, I'm sorry for that, but we can talk it over some other uh, way. No, I, 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 I don't, I wouldn't know how to answer that. There's a lot of questions in that questions. Okay, thank you. I think the last question is, as a mother and as an experimental physicist, would you please share your experience with female students to pursue the dream as scientists and engineers? I think I share it by showing my example. I always tell, I have always told my daughters and every young woman, student I've come close to, to never give up that they are women and never give up any dream that they can do whatever they can. I know it's hard, but it's hard for women as well for men. I mean, of course, we have uh, uh, often uh, more demands as women, uh, given the roles that society somehow, or even naturally that we feel um, uh, we need to, to, to fulfill these roles, but it is possible, I mean, my own experience, my own example is one in which it has been not easy to be a mother, a wife, a young professor and researcher and pushing your own, but your own research program. I had to miss many birthday parties. I had to tell my daughters often I couldn't be home for dinner because the experiment, you know, when you're doing especially experimental physics, there is no time you can stop, right? Sometimes you cannot stop, you have to go on. And so some disappointment, but at the end, my daughters have uh, always been understanding and understood that his mother was a bit crazy, but she was always there for them. It's possible to do it. It takes sacrifices, but it does for any profession if you want to, if, if you want to have it all, but you can have it all in the sense that, um, you need to find the right uh, level of support from family, from the society, from your institution, which often is not there. Um, but it's true that the example of many women in science, in physics, who managed to have a family, uh, to be mothers and to be great researchers, I think that is something that the more and more we show that it's possible, the more a young woman will feel, let's say, uh, triggered to follow the similar path. So the example is always important. It's not easy, but it's possible, and you need, of course, uh, the right support at all level. But the same, I would say, is for a man, to be honest. Dr. Aparland, thank you again for being our guest speaker tonight. Also, thank you all for attending tonight's event. If you have any more questions, please directly contact Professor Aprile or send an email to physics at hamlin.edu. Thank you. Good night. It has been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye Lisa. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.